Hey, praise the Lord. Welcome back. This is another fun featured week with the Word of God. Hallelujah. Hope you're doing well today. I want to talk to you today about some things that maybe you haven't considered. And what it's concerning is, does the bride of Christ have narcissistic attributes? Now, I can tell you of a surety that God could not be married to a narcissistic bride, but the bride itself can have some tendencies. So we need to analyze ourselves today and see where we're at. And we'll talk a little bit about this, this term narcissism. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's get started. Our gracious God, Lord, we thank you. We give you all the honor, all the glory, Lord. We thank you for waking up, waking us up another day, Lord, to be able to have time to, to dwell in your word and to be fed by your word. But Lord, at the same time, for the word to be a mirror to reflect so that we can see the areas in our life that doesn't line up with you and your word so that they can be corrected. Right now, we take full authority and control over every strong man spirit, every unclean spirit in the name of Jesus. We bind you and shackle you in the name of Jesus and we loose the spirit of God, your spirit, Lord, upon those so that their hearts and minds can hear the word of God and act upon the word of God. We thank you now and it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, hallelujah. I'm grateful to be here today, but I want to talk a little bit about the bride of Christ and these attributes of narcissism. Now, people use this term pretty regular, and in the Bible, the term is not even there. This is something that's come about years later after the Bible was written, but this was just a label to show a certain personality or even uh, things that a person would do. Now, let me just be honest with you. Uh, some of the traits and tendencies that are uh, associated with narcissism is actually probably in each and every one of us. And so we can see this. Now, here's the problem. What happens when we come to God and then we keep some of those fleshly attributes? And as a bride, we've got to find out what are we doing? You know, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, more powerful than a union of a husband and a wife together, working together for something. And that's what we need to look at. So first off, these are, these by none, these are, this is just a few of the attributes that are associated with this condition, which is a spirit. I believe that, that narcissism is based upon a spirit. I think Jezebel has a lot to do with some of these traits. But that's something else altogether different. So first thing is with narcissism, the spirit of this is very self-centered. It's all about me. It's never about anybody else. It's about me, 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 me. All right. The second thing is the, the power then that's used to manipulate to get what you want. I'm going to do something, whatever it takes to manipulate or trick into getting my way or throwing a tantrum or making a scene. These are things that happen in order to get their way. All right. Number three would be a lack of empathy. And we're going to go over the definitions. As somebody that can't really associate with what you're going through or something or a situation or condition. And then number four, probably one of the biggest things too, is a, they lack accountability. This spirit never wants to own what's going on. So with that said, let's get started. We need to ask another question. First off, we're talking about a bride. Why was Eve ever even created? So get your Bibles out. Let's go to Genesis chapter two. And I put a couple of things down here already so you can see. But in Genesis chapter two, verse 15 is where we're going to begin uh, in reading of the word of God. All right. So I don't want to just put things up here and then you're like, uh, you know, why is he putting this up? You, you got to have the word of God to back up exactly what it is that you're, you're uh, uh, stating. So, and the Lord of God took the man, this is verse 15, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now notice he's still just being called the man, the man, all right? And the Lord God commanded the man saying, out of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the God knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, Hmm, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought unto him unto Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature. That was the name thereof. 
And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay, so he's called the man, the man, the man, the man. He's given a job. Now, once he has a job, he gets a name. His name is Adam, and it means to be ruddy, or it even means like a red, because he was made from what? The dust of the earth, the clay. So his face was flushed. It was red. So everybody that's trying to get a color on man, and isn't it? the very first man was red. So, and he was, his name was given to him, Adam, once he was given a job. Now that he has a job, he's naming the animals, he's doing these things. But out of all the beasts of the field and everything else, none of these. I know people say that that dog is man's best friend, but guess what? That's not what God saw because God looked and he saw that there was no animals compatible with Adam. So there was two things. He said it wasn't good for him to be alone. So God was wanting to provide uh, companionship, this way, I'm sorry, companionship for Adam. In addition, he needed somebody to help him. He has a job. He's been given a job. And now guess what? He needs somebody that's going to be able to help him. Help me. Amen. All right. So with this said, this is why she was created. So wait a minute. I want you to think a little bit about the bride of Christ What are we made for? Guess what? Do you know, I believe that God was was showing us that, guess what? He wanted companionship. This is part of the reason in his his mindset to be able to declare from the, 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 he declares the end from the beginning. Guess what? He already knew about the sacrificing of of a body, his body, uh, to, to redeem us so that he could have a bride. He was wanting us. Now, It's no wonder that God was wanting to be able to love and have something of his own. But he knew already the frailty of our bodies and and just even the the, uh, interference that would come from Lucifer. All right. So I want to get into this. So how did it enter? This whole thing of being self-centered. How did it enter? Now, I want you to think about this for just a second because Lucifer, Lucifer was not like you and I. He didn't, he wasn't tempted by another being outside of himself. When he was in heaven, he saw how beautiful he was. He was anointed cherub. He's the one that would lead the angels in worship. His, his body was built, it was like basically like almost like an organ. It was made of pipes. He would pipe in. He, this is why music is very important with Satan. He has he has a certain ability with music and instruments. But he used to lead, think about this, he used to lead the angels. In worship. Wow. And guess what? So you look in the church, guess what? Guess guess where sometimes we'll see Satan really come in as somebody that's over in the music. Hallelujah. All right, listen. Okay. So how did this self-centeredness come in? Satan himself said, hey, I'm going to put my throne above the throne of God. So he thought that because as beautiful as he was, he deserved to be worshipped. And so what was he going to do? He wanted to elevate himself. So where was this? It was his own self-centeredness. He was, it's all about who? Me. This is why when you start looking at narcissistic uh, traits and so forth, it's a spirit and it comes right from Satan himself. Satan is all about who? Himself. My throne. I'm going to put my throne above your throne. As soon as there was another God in heaven, because there's only one true and living God, and and his name is Jesus, when this other God shows up in heaven and says, I'm going to make my throne above your throne, immediate war. And guess what happens? He's kicked out of heaven. So let's take a look in Genesis chapter 3. I want you to see Adam and Eve are in the garden. They've been made. They're perfect. There's nothing wrong with them. There's good vision, good sight. They're they're naked. They're plain before God. They're able to interact with the voice of God in his presence. But somebody comes along, and I want you to see who it is. All right. Verse 1. Now the serpent, this is Lucifer, was more subtle or tricky than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And watch what he says. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So 
The first thing he does is he wants to question what God does. In other words, who is he concerned about? Right now, he's, con he's, he's making it seem like he's concerned about Eve. Like, you can't eat from all of these trees? Or was it just one? Well, he said you couldn't eat. You could eat from all the trees, but there was one you couldn't eat from. So here it is. He's wanting her to focus on who? Herself. What am I missing out on? So this is how the spirit begins to enter. Watch this. So she, she's, she's looking and she's like, you can't eat from any of these trees. Now, he's real ignorant right now, but he's fixing to get some knowledge here in a second. So this self-centeredness comes as a result of us wanting to do for ourselves. We want it for me, for me, for me. So watch this. This is why, have you ever thought about this? A person never has to be taught to be selfish. You ever thought about that? Have you ever seen anyone trying to, to teach a child how to be selfish? No, man, what, what are you, man, that's crazy. Why would we teach a child to be selfish, right? That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. But you don't have to teach a child to be, made, uh, to be selfish. Why is that? What are you and I made from? When we die, we go back to the what? The ground. So let me use this as an example here. I've got a, a little camera lens cap. Now, this is not made from the dirt, but you and I are made from the dirt. But there's something that's going on. We're on this planet. Now, you tell me what happens. I have this lens cap right here, right now. If I let go, what happens to it? Tell me. It falls right down. Why? Well, you say, well, brother, that's very simple because that's gravity. Right. What's pulling it? The earth is doing what? Pulling itself back to itself. There's this central force that's pulling it back. You see this, this picture here of this girl here? You see she's got all these little dolls and stuff. Mm -hmm. What is that? This is this selfishness, this self-centeredness. It's me. Guess what? I'm pulling everything back to me. You don't ever have to teach someone to be selfish. They're just being the nature of what substance they've been made from. So this is why when a person is operating in this narcissistic system, I'm here to tell you, guess what's going on? They're operating in their flesh. This is why the bride of Christ cannot be narcissistic. He can't marry a narcissistic bride because the narcissistic bride would be fleshly and would not be spiritual. But we're going to look at the spiritual bride a little bit later. All right. So let's take a look now at the number two thing, which is manipulation. There's a lot that goes along in manipulation here. And I put the definition up here. It says to control or play upon by artful, unfair, or insidious means especially to one's own advantage. To change by artful or unfair means so as to serve one's purpose. To manipulate someone, it's to get them to do what you want. And it could be in a tr tricky or crafty way. And that's, that's all in the world that is, is to be able to do that, is to trick them, to get them to do something. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, which we should be still there. And we've already seen, we've already read verse 1. He said, you can't eat of any of the trees. So I want you to see Satan, how he's manipulating. Now, who is he manipulating right now? Who's he going after? Adam? No. So my thing is, it says that, that the serpent was already more subtle or tricky. My understanding is this. Everything that happens in the Old Testament is also a picture of what was going to take place in the New Testament. You remember Jesus was led in Matthew 4. It says he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil 40 days, 40 nights. Guess what? Did Satan get anywhere with Jesus? No, he left him. But guess who Satan has come after now? His bride. Isn't that interesting? Now, here's the difference. In the garden... Eve is there, and we know that Adam is with her because once she takes of this fruit and eats, that means she had to give it to him because he was right there. So watch this. Satan is after the bride of Christ to get her to be as self-centered, to be as manipulative as she can because once she gets to this point, she can't really function very well as a bride and be the wife of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, if you're getting some from this, just like, share, do this. People need to hear about this, all right? So let's go to verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, she said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now we know God didn't say you couldn't touch it, you just can't eat it. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, now watch this manipulation. Ye shall not surely die. He is now in direct contrariness to the word of God. He's like, no, you're not going to die. Watch this. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He's saying that he knows what God knows. Remember, he was going to elevate his throne above the throne of God. When he elevated his throne above the throne of God, what was he going to do? He was going to be above God. That's what got him kicked out of, of heaven. So when he says, I know what God knows, he, he, he's lying to you. Who's the father of all lies? Lucifer. Watch this. He said, so he says, your eyes are going to be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. What was it that Satan wanted? He wanted to be worshiped as a God. Now he knows the very thing that got him in trouble. He's passing along to you. Don't you want to be like God? Now, this is all manipulation. This is all a trap. So watch this. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. All right, so Adam is in trouble because he's sitting here watching what's going on, obviously. He's right there with her. He doesn't stop what's going on. And says, you know, hey, get away from my wife. So this is, this is a lesson for all husbands. Guess what? You cannot be passive in your household. But at the same time, I'll be honest with you, sometimes in some households, there may be an all-out fight between the husband and the wife because guess what? There's two heads in the house and it can't be. But there's a curse behind it and I'll show you that in a little bit later. So this manipulation can come in many forms. Let me show you something here. See, Lucifer always offers light, but it's not the real light. In 2 Corinthians, we'll go there, 2 Corinthians 11, I want you to see something. Because he can transform himself into a light. Have you ever heard somebody say, hey, you know what, let's shed a little light on this matter. You know what, when you say that, you think about it. There's only one true light, and that's the word of God. It's God himself. So in 2 Corinthians 11, I want you to see this. Lucifer, he's, he's, no, he's no joke. Watch this. And we're going to begin in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So what does he do? He can transform himself. Did you notice how he did this in, in Genesis? He said, did, did God say you can't eat from any of these trees? So the manipulation is beginning. See, this is where the whole ideology of quote unquote narcissism is. It's, it's just part of Satan's personality. Hallelujah. Let me, let me show you. This is something called gaslighting. And uh, maybe these are all psychological terms. These terms are not in the Bible, but guess what? People did things like this in the Bible. These are just terms that are known today. So gaslighting, what is it? It's to psychologically manipulate a person, usually over extended period of time, so that the victim questions the validity of their own thoughts, perception of reality, or memories and experiences. Uh, it says, Experiences confusion, loss of confidence, and self-esteem, and doubts concerning their own emotional or mental stability. And it says this is this is a subject them to gaslighting. So in other words, it would be something like me t cutting. This is where it came from. Apparently, it was a movie, and uh, this man was trying to trick this person into thinking that it was really. Uh, nighttime, I guess. I'm trying to remember the whole thing. i never seen the movie. But bottom line, can you imagine if they told you it's in the middle of the day and they said, no, it's nighttime. And they have dark curtains up all over the place. No, no. And they're like, no, I think it's day. No, it's night. And you keep consistently doing this. You're giving them a false narrative. Notice it's, it's, it's over an extended period of time so that it says the victim questions the validity of their own thoughts, perception of reality, memories, experiences, confusion. Think about this because what happens is Satan does that with us. He makes you begin to think, well, you know, is the word of God really real for me? I mean, has God really done for me? Has it? Well, guess what? The same thing is being used now with the bride. We can take and twist our own narrative and say, God, you know, I see it like this. Don't you see it like this? And we can keep telling God the same thing over and over and saying, yeah, but God, you don't know my situation. And yet he's very aware. But see, have you ever heard of this? People can tell their story. There's three sides to every story. Have you heard that? Three sides. They say there's yours, there's the other one, and then there's the truth. Because everybody has a tendency to tell the story according to what? What works for them. 
Hallelujah. See, so here's the thing. As a bride, we got to be paying attention. Are we self-centered? Are we beginning to make this? See, because Satan tricked Eve. She was deceived, it says. Here's the thing. When she was tricked, has she now begun to do the same thing? Has this the spirit of narcissism, because this narcissistic spirit, I'm telling you, it's sexless. It doesn't have to be a woman only. It can be a male. Matter of fact, there's a lot of times when people saying, oh, the males, you know, they think that they look so good. They do this and they manipulate these women. It goes on both sides. And then there's all these different types of definitions, some that are covert, some that are overt, some are more open and so forth. We're not here to talk about psychology because we know the one that has created the soul. But we also know the effects of this, which is the flesh. Hallelujah. So this whole idea of gaslighting, guess what? What was Satan saying when she, she said, you can't eat from any of these trees? He started the gaslighting process. He's making her doubt. No, 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 no. I, we can eat from all these trees. It's just the one in the center we can't eat from. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can't even touch it. Or would that, And then what does he say? Oh, you're not going to die. I'm not? No. See, a gaslight is nothing but a lie. Who's the father of all lies? Satan. So he he says what? He says, hey, you're not going to die. And he says, God knows that the day that you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God. You're going to know right from wrong. You're going to know about evil. You're going to know all this stuff. Whoa. And so guess what? What is she doubting now? She's doubting what was told to her about why she shouldn't eat this, this particular fruit. And so he gets in. He's tricked her into thinking this. Gaslighting is just merely another term for basically lying. All right. Now, another thing is a lack of empathy. Now, in order to reach the lost, this requires empathy. People that are operating under this narcissistic, in this narcissistic realm, guess what? It's a lack of empathy. What is empathy? It says the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicarious, vicarious vicariously, I, I say that, I joke so many times, now I'm saying it's wrong, I used to say vicariously, just to mess with people. Anyway, it says, look, it's the act of being sensitive to and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, uh, it says, of either the past or present without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in it in an ob- objectively manner. So here's the thing, it's understanding, it's basically where you're able to, to associate Maybe like, let's say that someone lost their child that died and you may not have lost a child, but you've lost a loved one. But then you can only imagine what it's like for them to have lost a child. Let's say it's an infant. Let's say it's a two or three year old, whatever. That's empathy. You're able to empathize. Man, you know what's going on. A person with this type of trait, they have no empathy. They can't relate. They can't even come in and, and uh, you know, they can't think through this. These, and so I want you to think about it. You couldn't reach the lost unless you have empathy. So Paul himself, you go to Romans, we're over here now. Go to Romans chapter 9. I want you to see this, this here, how Paul had empathy. See, you can't reach, see, the, the bride of Christ has got to have empathy. We can't be out here be thinking about ourselves. When you have empathy, guess who you're thinking about? You're thinking about someone else. Look at this. Look in Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also be bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and, watch this, continual sorrow in my heart. Why, Paul? What's going on? For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption of the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. What does he wish? I wish I could be accursed. Why? So that they could come into this. That's empathy. See, Paul knew from being a religious man, a Pharisee who was out Uh, He was persecuting the church. He was killing Christians. He was imprisoning them. And guess what? When God brought him out, it's not until then that he realized and he looks and he sees because through the eyes of faith and through the word of God and the revelations that came, this is why he thought he was doing good. This is why when he says, he said, Paul, he said that he was chief among sinners. What? A man that knew the word of God? What? A man that was an apostle that was going out starting churches? He said, I'm chief among the sinners. His mentality changed. Hallelujah. All right. There's a lack of accountability. 
there is a lack of accountability. There's no place for self-righteousness with God. We know in 1 Corinthians 1 and 29, I believe, that this says that there'll be no flesh will glory in his presence. No flesh. So accountability is being able, when you're wrong, to be able to say, that's me. Do you know that's one of the hardest things, especially when a person is in, uh, exhibiting any of these attributes, this is one of the main things is they can't even say I'm wrong. It takes an act of... I mean, it's almost like some kind of act of God where there's the hurricanes and the, I mean, do all the stars line up and did the sun melt one and this and that. Okay, I did it. Uh, okay, I apologize. They can't do it. It's so hard because guess what? It goes against the flesh. It goes against them because it's putting them down. But wait a minute. I thought the first step in, in obeying the gospel was the death, the death of you so that you could live for who? Live for him because guess what? It's, it's now Christ that's living in you. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who what? Lives in me. Isn't that amazing? So let's take a look at this. We're going to go to, uh, well, let's look, at, let's look at the, now let's look in Romans 10. We'll go to Romans 10. We're already in Romans 9. Let's go to Romans 10 real quick. I want you to see this. Here's part of this empathy, but look, this is one of the reasons why the Jewish people, they were having trouble actually coming to God. It's because guess what? They don't want to become guilty. Watch this. In uh, chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Because Israel wasn't saved, right? Look at this. For I by them, bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, they know the word of God, but guess what? They're not doing a very good job of uh, catching the concepts, especially when the word of God was made flesh and walked among them. Watch this. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone. You know what? I'm going to add this in here too. Let's go. I want you to see this. In Romans 3. Romans 3. Uh, watch this. Romans 3 verse 19. Romans 3 verse 19. Watch this. It says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now, these people here were becoming righteous because what, what were they doing? They were, make, they were going about to seek their own righteousness, not the righteousness of God. What did the Bible say? It's to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Watch this. It says, but it says, uh, what says the law? It says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is a, of knowledge of sin. So, first thing is, the law is supposed to do what? Make you shut up. Second thing is you become guilty, and the third thing is you have a knowledge of it. So, when a person is going about to do their own righteousness, then guess what? They are not able to humble themselves to the Word of God. Now, let me give you an example of someone that humbled themselves. See, if, if I'm praying for something, but I'm not acknowledging what I'm doing wrong, I'm not and I'm trying to manipulate God for something, number one, God already knows. Stop. Watch this. Go to Psalms 51. Psalms 51. Very famous psalm, and this was David. David had um, was confessing before God because he had an affair with... Anyway, let's go. Watch, let's read Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. It says, uh, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. What had happened was he had had uh, an affair. He had a, a sexual encounter with Bathsheba, and he was to blame for every last bit of it. There's, there's even more. Even murder comes out of this, the whole nine. And look what he says. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He said, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Let me tell you something. David is doing what? He's passing the blame. No, Bathsheba was looking good. She should have never been bathing up there like she was. 
we, you know what was interesting is it was at a time when the when the kings would be out to war and David wasn't out to war. See, that's what happens when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. See, that was a time when the kings were out to war and he stayed back. He was not, you know, he was hanging out. See, we get comfortable. And what happens is he looks out and then guess what? That's an open door for the enemy. So what does he do? He sees her and then he calls her up. Guess what? He has a child. This whole nine, this whole thing happens. And guess what? Now, instead of saying, hey, it was this, it was that, he says, I acknowledge. See, the bride of Christ, when you start putting things on somebody else, when you start telling other, it was because of this person or that person, or you know what, it was this, this situation, it was this. You got to think about your actions because here's David. He could have said all of these things, but God knows your heart. He knows, so don't play games with him. Now, I want to show you a curse that's been working since the beginning, and it's right here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Some of you are going to be like, ah, what do you mean there's been a curse? There's, God was, God had, when sin entered, there were some curses that were laid out. One was to the serpent. He said, hey, look. Uh, he said, look, you're going you're gonna to be cursed above all the cattle and everything else. He said, what? And you're going to crawl on your belly the rest of your day, days of your life, and you're going to eat the dust of the earth, which is interesting because you and I are made from what? the dust. See, we became the food. I know a lot of people don't think that and don't understand this, but we became not only the food, but the Bible talks about spirits. When they enter, guess what else we are? We're houses. So you think about it, a house and food, and they're feeding. These spirits begin, they want to feed off of, and they, they cram themselves in this and that. Um, for several years, that was something the Lord was using me for, was, was deliverance. I just want you to know that. that This is something that still takes place today. Hallelujah. All right. So this, this because we're dealing with the bride of Christ right now, I want you to see this, what happens with the woman. In verse 16, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, woman, woo wait a minute. See, see, it said rule over. Well, no, ah, uh -uh, no. First off, you got to understand what was said here. It says about the conception, there was going to be pain in, in childbearing and so forth, right? And it says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. This desire, it actually means like water to overflow, to, to run over. The woman's desire, this is part of the curse, was going to be that she was going to want to overrun her husband. You seen any of that in any households? So this was something that was a curse. But then it says what? It says, your desire shall be to thy husband. Now, you're going to try to run over your husband, and he shall rule over thee. In other words, he's going to have authority over you. Because see, guess what? In the garden, it says that she was deceived, but who sinned? It says, for by one man sin entered. Who got credit for sin? Adam. He was in charge. And that's usually how it happens. I'm on the fire department, so usually if something happens, a person does something, not only is the person that did it in trouble, but then the person that was over them. All right. So I want you to notice this. So this very thing is, guess what? How many of us have the same mindset now that we are the bride of Christ where we're trying to be we're self-centered? We're thinking about ourselves. We are trying to manipulate God to do certain things because we're asking not out of a pure heart, but out of pure greed, out of this flesh. And this is what, I, when we talk to God, is it is it like a wish list? And Lord, I need this, and can I get this? And then I need this to happen. And then if this happens, then this will happen. Wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. The whole point when Eve was created, she was to help Adam. As the bride of Christ, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be helping who? Our husband. And our husband is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. You know what's interesting is, I think sometimes too, there's women that, that I meet that they will say, you know what, it just seems like the, the Bible is so down on women that they're just, they're second rate, they're not as powerful, they this and that, and the man is this, and the man, and this, and this, and that. I said, you know what, you've been listening to Satan. It's real simple. You know what, let me just put this out there too. All you women, all you grown women out there, and even the younger mothers, all you mothers that have raised your daughters, or, or that you have told them, guess what, I'm going to raise you to be independent. You don't need a man for anything. Okay, well, that's great. That's great. You're, you're, you're teaching them that. But when they get married, 
Is that a biblical theme? Because I'm married to Christ. What do I need from Jesus? Boy, I need everything. But guess what? He's loved me and he's given everything for me. He's given everything that he had. He gave his life. We have to be very careful to make sure that what we are teaching our children. Same thing with, with the young men. We have to teach. Because see, here's the thing. Women, you have one role. And that role, which is interesting, is that you're serving. Here it is. You're learning to be this help me. The man, he has to be able to lead. Then he also has to be able to do what? Serve. You know, I, I was given a, a hard time about this because uh, people people in my own family, they they... They've kind of talked bad about this, but when I was in India, they're the people, there's something, and the people, all oh, these women from other countries, oh, they don't know. I mean, they're just brainwashed and this and that. Well, let me tell you what happened in India. While I was there, then guess what? While you eat, then people would serve you food and this and that. And But then your clothing, they would wash your clothes. But I, I would go into the restroom and I'd see a rock. And I was like, why is there a rock in these houses? And this rock would be in the houses and there'd be a big brush and a bar of soap and, a, and then a bucket and this and that. That's because they stonewash the clothes. Now, I'm not saying everybody in India does that, but there's still a lot of people that do that. And guess what? They would literally be washing, dipping the clothes. They'd have a bar uh, of soap and a brush and then they'd put it over the rock and they'd be washing it out. And then they'd dip it back in the water, rinse it out. And they were going, I was like, whoa. And I'm going to be honest with you. Me, I was touched so deep. I was like, I, I don't deserve anything like this. People don't realize there's power in serving. People are after power by manipulation, this narcissistic spirit, which is just straight Satan. He wants to get things done, but instead of serving, he manipulates. He makes it about him. He can't empathize. He can't see a need for this. No, everybody should see what's going on with me. I'm the one that's important. Is that that same spirit? Do you have that spirit? Is it, is it you? Is, it, is, is that how it is when it even comes to revival? Maybe it's we get caught up on, on physical things. You know, there's so many people that they begin to, to be, you know what, bro, we need this. And hey, we don't have, a, we don't have speakers for our church, but we're having a revival. And, and maybe, hey, we don't have uh, this or we don't have that. And guess what? And then, hey, rejoice that you have revival. God is pouring things out to you. He's going to give you everything that you need. But my God shall supply all your need. It didn't say needs, but my God shall supply all your need. This is in Philippians 4, 19. Your need, I only have one need. You've got one need. That need is him. If he's giving you souls, don't sell it short trying to get something else physical. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's keep going here. Now, I want to talk to you about the virtuous woman. This is how the bride of Christ should be. Go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. We're going to finish up here. Proverbs 31. I want you to see something. A lot of people go to this, and there's something that's just amazing about this that I think a lot of you, I think you maybe if you haven't heard this, then Lord willing, you'll get it today. Hallelujah. And this is this was actually a woman that was teaching her son. Watch this. In verse 1, it says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now watch this. I'm not going to read all through this, but it says, What? It says, My son. And what? It says, the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. Give not that, watch this, advice here from a woman. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Two things, right off the bat. Don't give your strength to women. And you got to watch it if you're drinking. Don't, no, don't do it. It's not for you to drink. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Now, I know you're going to laugh at me, but being around women, it's funny because women know women. They could tell you, did you see what she was doing? I know exactly what she was doing. And I could tell this. And why is it? I mean, it's like, they know. And then they'll say, look at it. And that big dummy, he's over there. He's just talking with her. And she is just... She's playing the fiddle for him and she's getting him ready. Oh, just flirting with him and oh, and oh, can you do this? And oh, can you? And the women are like, mm, oh my goodness. There was one person that I had been working with. They were looking and they saw another and said, oh my goodness, that person, they just are in heat. And I was like, oh, whoa, wait a minute. 
I'm like, oh my God. Because, but you know what? Women know women. And here's a mother saying, hey, hey, don't give your strength to women. Now, my question, do you think that God himself, who's our husband, you think he's just going to be manipulated by us? Not so. But watch this. We're going to get down to what this virtuous woman is. Verse 10. Now, it says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Now, stop. What kind of woman? It says right there, a virtuous woman. I want to ask you a question. What does this word virtuous mean? See, because a lot of the modern women will say, yeah, the Bible, they, they, it just talks bad about women and they're just powerless and this and that. Do you remember when Jesus was walking and someone had touched his clothing and it says that something came out of him? What was it that came out of him? Virtue. That's power. Yeah, you didn't pick up on that, did you? He said, who touched me? I felt virtue. I felt power leave my body. Remember, electricity always, power always follows the path of least resistance. So as the bride, am I that, am I that bride that's fighting him tooth and nail? No, and I'm not doing that. You told me to do that. I'm not doing that. Let me tell you. No, you asked me to do it, but I'm not doing it. And I, la, 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 la. That's not a virtuous woman. That's not a powerful woman. That is someone that is trying to control. And you're not going to control Christ. But watch this. So I want you to think about this. This is, this is talking about a powerful woman. The church, the bride of Christ, is very powerful. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is above rubies. Why do you think Jesus paid the price he did for us. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. What is she doing? She's serving him. She's taking care of him. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's not being told and forced to do something. She does it on her own. Are you serving God today because I have to so I can go to heaven? Then maybe your heart is not right. It says, verse 14, she is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She not only takes care of her household, even the servants that are in her house. Serving. How about that? She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hand. She planteth a vineyard. Look, she's got her, this, this is what she's doing. She... You ever hear people say, well, what are you bringing to the table? Look what the church, look what this bride is bringing to the table. She's doing what? She's planting. She's bringing in fruit. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. That's another euphemism here of, of being in Christ. Look at this. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sitteth among the elders of the land, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. Oh, she's weak. She's less than. No, strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. What is the bride of Christ? She's powerful, a virtuous, a powerful woman. Look at this. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. What is she doing? She's taking care of the house. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, that respects the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Isn't this amazing what this woman, she's a woman that's considered powerful. See, Christ doesn't look at his bride, the church, as some weakling. Oh no, oh no. He looks at her as what? A powerful presence. Because guess what? Now you, you think about this. 
a lot of times women too, some of them, as brides, we have to think, because I'm, I'm a bride, I'm part of the bride of Christ. We have to look at our influence. Have you ever seen the football players and maybe basketball or whatever, and they put the camera on them or whatever, and what's the first thing they do when you see them? What are they doing? They're saying, hi, mom. Hey, hey, ma. How much influence does that mother have on that child? We're talking a woman that raised someone of leadership and authority. And what, what do they do? Hi, Mom. Hi. But you don't understand the power that's there. And the thing is, this woman that is powerful, she knows her place in this marriage. She's going to take care of the husband where he doesn't feel threatened, where he doesn't feel like, I, I'm not safe here. Because what's happening? It's all about me. Well, you know, hey, so what are we doing? We should be out seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We should be out preaching the gospel, telling people, giving them and, and doing these things. But guess what? If it's all about us, well, you know, hey, I got other stuff to do. And this is kind of getting in my way. A virtuous woman is a powerful woman. And she knows her power because she's connected to what? Her husband. And the husband, who just so happens to be the king of kings and the lord of lords, guess what? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? He'll, he'll provide everything. What do you mean provide everything? Everything that you need. He said he'll give you the desires of your heart. Have you ever seen that? Can you imagine that as a wife? If I'm doing the things that, that my husband needs. He said this. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. These things are not grievous to you. So the word of God is not, oh my God. That's right. No, instead you're like, I want to serve him. I saw a woman that was being asked by her husband, and she apparently was from uh, another land, and she was being asked, he said, why did you tell me that you want to fix food for me? And then she got kind of emotional. She said, well, because you need your strength, and you're going to work and take care of us, and this and that. And She's going through all of this saying these things, and, and she's tearing up, and he said, but but why? She said, because I love you and I want to do these things. See, that was what was going on when I was in India. The people, they didn't necessarily love me like in, a, in this. They, they, are, they are respected me. They loved me. But I felt unworthy to be having my clothes washed that way, to being served food and this and that. But I realized there's power in service. Don't think that God is some idiot that he's like, ah, yeah, I'm taking you for example. I got all y'all as slaves. No. He's already given everything for us. Hallelujah. Listen. <laughs> As the bride of Christ, there have been times that I have been self-centered. It's been about me. And then there would be things that even in my life that I would be trying to manipulate for my own good. There were times that I wouldn't have the empathy or be able to see what people were going through because my eyes were stuck on me. There have been times where I would not even admit my wrong. And I try to pass on even to my kids. Serve God, but the number one thing too is always take accountability for whatever it is that's going on. This is what made David a man after his own heart. Are we, as the bride of Christ, are we suffering from narcissistic tendencies? Is it about us? Are we trying to manipulate God? Can we see our brothers and sisters who are lacking, who are dying and going to hell? Are we like Paul where we said, I wish I could be cast away for the people, for Israel? Just recently I was driving and I remember driving that as I was doing so the Lord 
as I'm seeing people from the freeway and people walking and living and doing their life, and he says, do you love these enough to tell them the truth? And I had to think, yes, Lord, because it's not about me. I'm just a help meet. What is my job? My job is to be that virtuous woman, the bride of Christ that's willing to get up in the middle of the night, that's willing to serve, that's willing to do the things that are necessary for the household of God and not complain and know that this is just merely my service, my reasonable service. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Maybe, maybe you need something very important. Maybe what you need right now is to repent because guess what? You're coming to God and the way you're coming to God is when you're coming to God, it's about you and you have these narcissistic tendencies. But God's not gonna keep a narcissistic bride, I can tell you that. You gotta humble yourself. Oh, gracious God, Lord, I just thank you right now. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to be able to look inside of ourselves to see the very things that are not lining up with your word. Lord, where we've been self-centered, self-righteous, Lord, where, Lord, we would manipulate things for our own good instead of the good of the kingdom, instead of seeking first the kingdom, your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord. Lord, where we would, we would not even use empathy to see those around us and take our eyes off of ourselves, but would be looking and viewing what it is that is needed, Lord, that they would need you. And then, Lord, when we're wrong, that we would not even acknowledge it. But Lord, I acknowledge my lack of discipline, my lack in many areas where I wouldn't allow you to, to be the, the God in my life and the, and the one that would just lead me because you're my shepherd and I shall not want. Lord, let me begin. Let us all begin to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord. Let us put away everything else and let us begin to th think about those that need you, Lord. It's in your precious name right now, Jesus, that we pray. And we'll be sure to give you all the honor and all the glory. It's in your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you. May he keep you. And until we see each other again on this time, amen.